Welcome to the New Books Network. What constitutes theory? What gets recognized as a body of theoretical work? And who counts as a theorist? My guest today, Musa Bunis, has written a book that thinks through these questions in the interwar Black Atlantic. On the Scale of the World, the Formation of Black Anticolonial Thought was published in 2022 by the University of California Press. The book argues that a dispersed archive of Black Atlantic anti-colonial theory has been hiding in plain sight. Usually dismissed as parochial or nationalistic, Musab instead shows that Black anti-colonial thought was resolutely global. The book examines interwar writings of Black intellectuals in English and French in the Americas, Europe, and West Africa to tease out a theoretical moment that is largely assumed not to have happened at all. Welcome to the New Books Network. I'm your host, Siviza Prospiri. Today, as I just mentioned, my guest is Musab Yunus. Musab is a senior lecturer in politics and international relations at Queen Mary University of London in Paris. He specializes in international political thought with a focus on race, empire, and anti-colonialism, especially during the late 19th and 20th centuries. Musab, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm delighted to talk about On the Scale of the World. Uh, before we encounter the book, let's encounter you. Give us a little bit of a sense of, of who you are and how you came to this project. So I work on the history of political thought, in particular as it relates to empire and anti-colonialism. And the way I came to this project was actually, I began a bit later. My research um, before this focused on Kwame Nkrumah and his attempt to form a kind of United States of Africa. And I was very interested in that project and why it didn't succeed, but also the kind of intellectual basis for it. And the more I looked into um, Kwame Nkrumah's Pan-Africanism, the more I realized that its intellectual roots lay in the interwar period in the 20s and 30s in particular. And so I became very interested in that, that period, which I saw as in- incredibly intellectually productive for the Black Atlantic as a whole with reverberations that go way beyond the interwar period. And I became um, very keen to explore the archives of Black Atlantic interwar thought and think about their implications. Well, since this book is so much about the texts that that you've unearthed and that you've pulled together to form this Black Atlantic archive, I thought maybe we could begin with a a text that you found uh, meaningful and that, that kind of encapsulates some of the work that you've done? Yeah, so, I mean, the epigraph to the book, I had a few different options of what I was going to put there. And then I found this this quotation from the West African pilot, of course, the Nigerian newspaper founded by Nandi Ezekiwe in the 30s. And it, I didn't actually discuss this quotation in the book, but in a way I felt like it really encapsulated so much of what the book was about. And this article in the West African pilot, I mean, it begins by saying... You know, we've been called a, a, a moron race, an infant race, a dying race. Um, and it continues by arguing we are classed amongst the so-called minority groups, retarded races, backward races. Um, and then it continues by saying the so-called virile and progressive races say to us, you moribund pre- creatures must speedily give place, make place for us. Your survival will contaminate the life, the culture and civilization of the quality which we want to evolve upon this planet. And I thought really that encapsulated so much of what the book was about because there's this sense in which the writer of the West African pilot article is addressing a kind of planetary system of race that doesn't have a place for Africans and for black people. And there's a sense in which um, by confronting the incredible kind of destructiveness and even kind of exterminatory rhetoric of colonialism and racism. Um, The writer of this article is coming to their own conclusions about um, what form of politics is needed to really contest that extremely powerful and, and violent discourse. So the sense in which there's a project for the future of the planet that doesn't involve Africans. You know, that's such an important way in which black anti-colonial thought comes to address the idea of colonialism. And I think that's something that we can 
a uh, hundred years later, very often fail to see or miss. We can fail to see the extent to which, and we can talk about this a bit later, but colonialism comes really to be seen as extirpatory, as violent in an ontological sense for African black peoples. And that the, the anti-colonial project therefore has an incredible form of um, necessity to it and, and urgency because of the, 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 the colonial planetary project that it's trying to counter. Which I suppose brings us to the title, On the Scale of the World. Yeah. So I thought going through this archive, um, I kept coming back to the question of scale and the ways in which that there were, of course, many different arguments being made in relation to colonialism, different forms of anti-colonial um, discourse. And yet what, to me... <clears throat> what united them all was the kind of scalar form of argumentation. You know, there was a way in which scale was being used to make a case for an anti-colonial uh, politics. Um, and often that meant ju- what I use the phrase from the geographer Neil Smith, jumping scales, to talk about the ways in which um, a, a smaller scale like a nation or a colony or even an empire is in a sense, jumped that it's it's um, it's contextualized within a broader system, and it's out of that form of scalar contextualization to say, actually, this empire is only one of many empires, and actually, we live in an imperial system. Actually, we live in a global racial system, and that system is intrinsically global. It's out of that argument that we see many of the most important anti-colonial conclusions coming. And I really thought that had been missed in some of the other writing on anti-colonial thought, which has often tended to be very focused on individual spaces. Let's say the French Empire State, the British Empire, the US. Um, and I think that we can often miss the kind of global form of argumentation um, by doing that. Well, one of the, I think, most interesting arguments that your book puts forward is this idea of kind of reclaiming global and the global scale um, for anti-colonial thought that is often really assumed to be the preserve of Marxist thinking or even liberal internationalism or uh, maybe later on dependency theory, a subset of Marxism. And here what you are doing, I think, is kind of excavating this globality that the surreptitious globality, as you, you call it, a phrase I think is is really lovely. And you're kind of showing this. This was there all along, right? And it it is something that wasn't and didn't arrive later and wasn't found later, but actually was um, deeply informing the the politics of the post war period. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I um. W- I, I really wanted to counter this idea that the planetary scale and the global scale are the province of the imperial vision completely. They're the province of power. And there's a branch of critical theory that has taken many different variations, you know, post-human, Foucauldian, um, where the idea of the global has come to be viewed with a lot of suspicion. It's come to be seen as something that... Um, is antithetical to positioned critique, right? Global critique reflects an imperial view of the world. And therefore, you know, if we if we don't want to replicate that imperial vision, what we need to do is not be global. And so for me, anti-colonial globalism was a really interesting repost to that idea to say, in what ways can, you know, what's been called the Apollonian gaze of empire, which looks at the whole world, in what ways can that be subverted by anti-colonial uh, methods while still retaining, in fact, elements of that globality and thinking about how they might be useful for a kind of counter-colonial project? A kind of position into globality. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get into some of the kind of parameters of the work to, to clarify for, for our listeners. So... Who, whose texts are you looking at closely in this book? And where are these people 
positioned or situated? Mm. So I look at three kind of key nodes of the Black Atlantic in the interwar period. Um, one of them is France, and there I particularly focus on uh, black newspapers published in Paris in the 20s and 30s. Um, one of the ones that I look at probably the most is a newspaper called La Race Negre, which was founded by Lamine Senghor. Um, and also run by him and Garon Guillette, um in the late 20s and early 30s. Um, I mean, Lamine Senghor dies in, in 27. So that was the French side. The US side, I was particularly interested in Garvey and his newspaper, Negro World. Um, and then the West African side, I looked particularly at, at English language newspapers in colonial West Africa, so Sierra Leone, um, colonial Ghana, Gold Coast, and Nigeria in particular. Um, and I, I did see these as kind of, these locations are of course very dispersed, they're very far apart geographically, and yet they were all kind of grappling with many of the same things, many of the same concepts and ideas, and I did think there was a kind of intellectual thought zone that united these three locations. And one of the things I was particularly interested in is thinking about similarities between the arguments that you see being expressed in these different places at this time. Um, aside from newspapers, of course, I also looked at kind of books, monographs, I looked at poetry and novels as well in the following these three locations. One thing that I think um, is implicit is the fact that there are all of these English language um, newspapers in West Africa written owned, operated by Africans, and that that's not the case in um, French West Africa. And yet that kind of intellectual activity is taking place in France itself. And I think that that's um, really a result of the, the, the colonial press laws in which I think in, in France only citizens could 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 own and operate newspapers, whereas in the, in the British Empire, those press laws were allowed colonial subjects and anomaly colonial subjects to also uh, engage in in publication of newspapers. And so that it's something is interesting also about this archive where the uh, West African texts from the Anglophone side are happening in West Africa, whereas the West African texts or the African and Caribbean texts in France are happening in the metropole. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I'm really glad you mentioned that because it, I think it's so important to think about the infrastructures that are available in the in the colonies and particularly in West Africa. I, I mean, I, I actually, I went to Senegal and Benin to read the French language newspapers that were published in French at this time. And of course, they were just, being, it was a, a much more repressive environment and what they were allowed to say um, was on a different different scale, different order. Um, so you you might say they were there was a yeah there was a you didn't get anything like a Sierra Leonean newspaper in Dakar. In fact, um, travelers in West Africa, um, there's an American traveler who goes from Liberia to Sierra Leone, and he remarks on how much um, how Sierra Leone is this kind of hive of anti-colonial discourse and activity, which you would never see in Dakar. He argues that it's shocking. Sydney de la Rue, he's called. And that was something I, I became very interested in, but I thought really that was in a sense a different project to talk about those newspapers in, in Benin, Dahomey in particular. Um, there was a really interesting constellation of newspapers that emerged at that time, but discursively they were so different and there was a lot of, um, they had to be very, very careful in how they talked about politics and colonialism. And really that wasn't what we saw in Paris. Of course, Paris, um, there was, an enormous amount of repression of colonial expatriates. Uh, and yet they were able to set up newspapers that articulated in quite a direct and free way um, arguments in relation to colonialism. And I felt like th those were the kind of most useful comparisons to the English language West African newspapers that I was looking at. It's interesting sometimes what what books leave out, right? As much as what, uh, what, what ends up um, making that its way into the text. Um, so these these people whose whose writings you're reading are uh, journalists, politicians, poets, novelists, 
uh, travelers, scholars, historians, um, but they are male almost universally in 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 the the text that you're looking at. And you you talk about that in the book, and you talk about this kind of patriarchal anti-colonialism, and yet you say that this doesn't uh, preclude an intervention in thinking about gender. Yeah. So I I mean I was really interested in a lot of the work that we have that looks at the 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 the, the kind of patriarchal constitution of the archive and the ways in which the archive obviously reflects gendered relations of production, who gets to write, who gets to edit, who gets to produce. I mean, it's not true to say that only men were involved in these newspapers, uh, but it is true to say that, you know, they were kind of dominated um, by men. Um, and I was going through a lot of the, the incredible work that we have now, um, looking at the history of women, particularly black women, in relation to black internationalism. Um, scholars like Keisha Blaine, Cheryl Higashida, Annette Joseph Gabriel. Uh, and what struck me was also the sense in which when I when I when I thought about that in relation to some of the work by people like Hortense Spillers, thinking about the ways in which histories of race encourage a kind of reformulation of some of the categories of gender that we use. I also came to wonder if there's forms of argumentation within this anti-colonial archive that can actually be useful for us in thinking about gender at a later stage. And one of the things that struck me was actually how um, the forms of scalar argumentation that we see in this anti-colonial archive, which seek to connect the you know world scale processes of accumulation and dispossession to very intimate and corporeal sensations um, actually characterize forms of feminist theory as well at a later stage and so social reproduction theory i felt like it was doing a lot of the same things that anti-colonial theory was doing at this earlier stage so i i wondered if we could kind of accept and understand the ways in which this archive exists within and reflects certain gendered conditions of um, production. And at the same time, think about whether there, there are ways in which for um, a feminist and gender analysis, there are, there are things that are happening within these texts that, that become, in a sense, kind of advances that, that can be used later on. And I do think, for me, one of the, one of the key kind of historical people that, that I was thinking with here was Keisha Blaine because, you know, she's very interested in the ways in which black women engage with um, black nationalism and often quite surprising results emerge. You know, organizations that seem very patriarchal can then become um, platforms for women's leadership. And, you know, I thought that looking at that as a historical phenomenon, I wanted to try and understand some of the theoretical basis for that. So these are the people that, that, you, that you're looking at. Can you also situate us in time? How, why do you understand these interwar years as being so critical for uh, the development of anti-colonial thought? Mm. So there's a couple of things here. One is um, Pan-Africanism is much older than the interwar period. But I suggest in the book that the idea of Pan-Africanism, which was essentially to connect the kind of scattered constituencies of the African continent and diaspora, uh, it, it wasn't really able to be realized before the interwar period because of the advances in communications, technology, and travel that we get in that time. And so it's the first time that there's a kind of sense in which there's a technological and material capacity that matches the ideation or the idea of Pan-Africanism. And then the other thing is, of course, that, I mean, 1919, you have the Paris Peace Conference. There is a global conference trying to address the future of the world and trying to construct a kind of um, global system for managing the world. And that sense of the 
the, the this period as being an age of globalism, as being an age in which people are thinking about the world as a whole, is of course really important to Black Atlantic thinkers as well. So they draw on all of these different visions. I mean, people have called this the age of globalism, and I think that's really important for understanding the anti-colonial globalism. One of the things that I also felt was kind of missing from all of this writing about global visions and globalism, um, particularly during this period, was black globalism, um, as I suggest that we could call it. And I did think it had distinctive features, which although they it was embedded in this broader context. So black thinkers were involved in surrealism, they were involved in liberalism, they were involved in international relations as a field. Um, they also developed the kind, uh, what I suggest is a black Atlantic form of globalism, which had specific characteristics and dimensions, and which, as we go into a later period of post-independence, you know, as Adam Gessichu has argued, um, fuel a particular kind of political project across the Black Atlantic. So you begin the book uh, with a chapter that thinks through the globality of Marcus Garvey. And I think that this is a, a really interesting kind of balance of the directions that, that studies of Garvey have, have taken. And I think the, the really most, um, you know, just tangible example of this is uh, is the flag. So can you talk a little bit about kind of how you understand Garvey as a global figure proposing a, a, a black globalism and and then the origins of uh, of the Garvey flag? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I came to the flag, I was reading the, the newspaper, The Negro World, and it's also interesting to me how few <clears throat> historical studies and theoretical studies beyond you know, people like Robert Hill, who are st scholars of Garvey, have done incredible work. But so few people have read the newspaper in, in detail. And I felt like there was so much happening there in terms of the discourse of, of Negro world that didn't seem to me to, when I went back and looked at some of the discussions of Garvey, and you know, there's the kind of divide in the literature where on the one hand, you have a kind of hagiography um, of just like a very, very, kind of positive outlook on Garvey and on the other hand you have like these very strong critiques of people saying what Garvey was you know he was racialist he was anti-semitic he was um a kind of he replicated he was a fascist or a kind of proto-fascist um and you have evidence for all those things um so you have evidence for I think a very open kind of worldly form of Garvey and, and a closed one so I tried to understand well what was it about Garvey's discourse? What was it about the things that the UNIA, uh, Garvey's organization, was saying that became so powerful and so influential? I mean, they created probably the biggest mass Pan-African movement in history. Um, and looking at the, the, the newspaper, Negro World, I felt all of these forms of global intervention, scalar intervention, in which Garvey despite some of the more narrow-minded um, elements of his thought that he sometimes expressed and other people expressed, actually against that, what we found very insistently was the idea of black liberation as a global project that fit with global anti-colonialism. And Garvey's, what I suggest is the UNIA's kind of aesthetic of nationalism um, was intended to place black people and Africans, what the UNIA called Africans at home and abroad, um, within the ranks of colonized nations recovering their sovereignty. Um, and not in any sense as it wasn't, I see it as a hermetic project that was seeking to differentiate between people based upon any form of kind of bio biological conception of race and yeah but i found this fantastically interesting article by garvey about called our moroccans and algerians negroes in which he mocks the idea that we can create biological distinctions between people of color um and he suggests that he argues for the primacy of what he calls condition over color in fact what unites moroccans algerians 
and other Africans, in his view, is they all have an interest in overthrowing white imperialism. And so I think that was the, the context in which I saw the flag coming. You know, the flag is so interesting because it can be seen as a form of division, something that's hermetic and um, divisive. Um, and some later kind of understandings of that flag, the red, black, and green, tri- you know, um, black flag have been have, have taken that view. And yet, what I found in the history of the flag was that a its direct precursors were flags that explicitly sought to create unity between African Americans and what was called the colored races of the world. And Garvey himself, when he talked about the flag, often talked about this kind of amalgamating and unifying dimension of the flag. You know, there's a fascinating interview where he claims that the green of the flag is actually a reference to the Irish struggle for freedom. And that was very interesting to me. It was also because the flag was so powerful for the UNI members. I often saw it referred to by letters to the editor in Negro World. And there was a sense in which there was such pride in, in possessing a flag. And yet, what was that flag doing? And I, I suggest it was gesturing to the sense of global liberation, solidarity with the anti-colonial struggle on a global scale. Well, if you take Garvey, a uh, Garvey, and you return to an understanding of him in which he's so resolutely global, and then you think also about the um, about the other thinkers and writers that you're looking at, I think. It, as we kind of mentioned before, it it kind of upends the idea that thinking about um, exploitation on a global scale is coming in heavy quotation marks to Africa, especially only as a consequence of uh, Latin American dependency thinking, or only as a consequence of decolonization. Yeah, I mean, it was almost quite shocking to me when I looked at these histories of structuralist economic thought and the history you know the 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 histories of thought that kind of focus on dependency theory the extent to which they all seem to agree that dependency theory and structuralism arrived in africa from latin america like essentially in the 70s and that uh dependency theory is invented in latin america in the 50s and 60s and then it travels across the world and people like walter rodney and wallerstein kind of imported to africa in the 70s, and I thought, well, what that completely ignores is a very long history of thinking about Africa in a global context on the African continent. That goes back, I mean, at least to the early 1900s. I mean, I talk in the book about some of the precursors to this interwar thinking by people like Blyden and Casey Hayford, and those are in the early 1900s. And I felt like that we were really missing an intellectual history of structuralist thought across the Black Atlantic, <clears throat> which which also centers Africa as a place where structuralist economic thought is happening. Um, one of the reasons I think that that is not well understood within the intellectual histories that we have is that it tends to be published in newspapers, and those newspapers haven't been looked at as sources of history of economic thought. Um, and so what that means is, for example, I mean, that in in colonial Ghana, we have these cocoa holdups in the 30s where cocoa producers, rather than sell their cocoa to the colonial office at in, in artificially lowered prices, they burn the cocoa and they go on what essentially sellers strikes. Of course, they have an idea of how what they're doing is both shaped by and trying to influence the global economy and the ways in which West Africa has been placed in what they see as a subservient position. You know, one one Gaudet writer calls it solely contingent at this time. And yet I found that histories of thinking about West African structuralism that completely ignore this period and they begin in in the 60s and, and really in the 70s. And so I was really trying to connect that that history together and say, well, there's, a, there's actually a long history of trying to think about how the Black Atlantic exists within a global system and why the anti-colonial project needs to try and target that system in some way for the purposes of Black liberation. You, you put it 
quite neatly, I think, and when you said that these Black Atlantic thinkers um, stressed race over the operation of abstract capital. Mm, yeah. Which I, I, I think it goes to... back to that that kind of position in globalism, right? Exactly. And there I was also trying to draw a distinction between the kind of very, the, the standard Comintern view and the Black Atlantic view that, that emerged. Because of course, a lot of the, you know, there is a vision of an exploitative world that's being put forward by the Communist Party and the Communist International in the 20s and 30s. And I think one of the, I, I was thinking a lot about how the things that I was looking at both relate to that because they're not completely a, opposed to the communist view. And yet they are distinct from it. And one of the things that kind of <clears throat> kept coming up over and over again was the centering of race as a way in which the form of global exploitation that Africans suffer under functions, it functions through race. And that was something that these Black Atlantic thinkers were insistently saying in lots of different ways and that we didn't see in the kind of standard Comintern analyses. And I think that this is also a really important prefiguration of later arguments that we see by people like Cedric Robinson which also center the kind of affinities, racial affinities that lie behind global forms of exploitation. Well, and of course, as much as these thinkers are thinking about uh, black globalism, they're of course offering a, um, a what you call a critique of whiteness from below. Mm, yeah. Can you elaborate on kind of that idea and how you see it operating in these texts? Yeah, so I mean, I have a chapter that kind of explores this idea of whiteness in, in black anti-colonial thinking at this time. And it was very striking to me the ways in which black thinkers in different places, you know, whether it was the US, Paris, or West Africa, kept coming back to this idea of whiteness as being a kind of unifying feature of the imperial structure, which in some sense, characterized the relationship of exploitation, <clears throat> excuse me, that existed between Europe and and um, and the rest of the world, the colonized world. And what I thought was so important about that was one of it was often gesturing towards a different scale of exploitation. So when I looked in Paris, for example, at the ways in which black newspapers there, even newspapers that we think of as not particularly radical, like La Dépêche Africaine, were in some ways quite insistently and quite surprisingly um, referring to and speaking about and explaining the existence of a form of kind of ideology of white supremacy. Um, they were very preoccupied with that ideology and explaining it to their readers and conveying it to their readers, often in all of it kind of quite shockingly racist and even genocidal rhetoric. Uh, and again, we see that in West Africa as well, you know, very, um, very violent white supremacist rhetoric is very, is, is often reproduced in West African newspapers At, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to show West African readers um, what, to, to quote one article from the Gold Coast Leader, what's at the back of the white man's mind. And in all of these cases, what I thought was happening was also a sense in which these writers are gesturing towards forms of pan-imperial solidarity and affinity, where actually if white supremacy, as the Gold Coast leader has it, is the aim of the imperial system, well, that that isn't just confined to one empire. And it doesn't really make a difference if you're go governed by the British or the French or the Portuguese, or even the Americans, because ultimately all of them are seeking the same thing, which is white supremacy. And that completely contradicts, of course, the imperial rhetoric of the time where, where um, even if in a certain kind of unguarded moments and on the fringes, white supremacist rhetoric was, was quite prevalent at this time. You know, the mainstream imperialist framings, whether from the British to the French, uh, the Portuguese, the Belgians, it was all about development. And it was all about the individualism of the empire, the ways in which the empires are not the same. You know, the British, we're not the same as the French, the French, we're not the same as the Belgians. And we, we are offering opportunities. We are offering forms of development, forms of progression for our colonial subjects. And by pointing to whiteness 
in all of these different ways, I felt like there was a kind of world, um, world spanning category of exploitation and also a form of global division, of course, which pits Europe against everyone else. Um, and by gesturing to that, there was also a kind of image of the world that kept reappearing in anti-colonial thought as divided between what we later came to call North and South. And there's actually a very material practice that you talk about, you just mentioned it, especially in the West African newspapers, of finding excerpts from other newspapers and reprinting them and kind of a big collage in order to add this global conversation, even if um, it's happening um, in ways that don't aren't perceived to be global by other actors. Mm. Yeah, I really wanted to draw attention to the kind of textual forms of the argumentation that I I was encountering, um, because I thought it was the formal dimension to the text was so important. And one of the things I've been drawing on scholars of Black Atlantic, and well, particularly in different contexts, people have worked on this in different ways, you know, um, um, but people like Stephanie Newell in West Africa talking about the 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 very textual nature of West African writing at this time and what's going on with um with the forms of um of writing that we see emerging. And one of the things I found in, in the newspapers across all of these different places was a very insistent form of kind of what what I call bricolage and, and recontextualization and citation in particular were texts that came from the metropole were kind of reinterpreted for black audiences in very particular ways. And often that process of discovery and reinterpretation was actually performed in the text. So there was a kind of, wow, the other day I was reading this newspaper from London and here's what I found. And, and then there's like a long quotation. And, um, you know, scholars of West African newspapers have talked about this, but often these glimpses of, of metropolitan discourse traveled across West Africa through these newspapers and were reproduced. And each time they were reproduced, they attracted a different commentary. And there was something really important here, I felt, about the ways in which those that information from the metropole was both gleaned and then kind of relayed and turned into a form of argument. And it really connected to my, 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 my idea of um, there being something surreptitious about the, this form of um, anti-colonial argumentation in which it wasn't trying to develop uh, a political theory from a place of uh, authenticity or neutrality that stood completely outside of colonial discourse. It said it was developing it in relation to and against colonial discourse. So there was, this, there was a sense in which, well, we have to read and understand what the imperialists are saying in order to develop our own form of anti-colonial politics. And I thought that was incredibly important. And so I tried to draw attention to that, the formalistic elements of those texts. And just um, in a, as an aside, I felt like there were incredible interventions in thinking about the literary form of um, writing at this time, particularly West African writing. I think of people like Ato Grayson. Um, and yet I felt like some of the form, formal innovations and, and qualities of writing um, in newspapers and political writing hadn't been given the same attention as literary writing. I wanted to just kind of bring, bring those together. I wanted to move us to the final chapter of the book where, you know, as you've just kind of laid out this um, thinking about, you know, countering imperialism. So mm. you kind of have this, this as we've been talking about it, a sense that what we've been talking about is only about kind of the imperial order and the, the colonized or the anti-colonial. And actually your final chapter is devoted to complicating um, this kind of binary in the sense that you have three uh, black or African states, which are nominally sovereign, but Haiti, uh, Ethiopia, and Liberia in the interwar period, but whose sovereignty is, um, let's say, certainly not, not full and and you talk about the discourses of racial colonial time that are used to undermine the sovereignty of uh, these black countries during the interwar period. 
Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was a particularly important thing to think about that Black Atlantic rice is thought about a lot in that period. And what was interesting to me is also um, following that period, following this in after the Second World War, um, they, that almost dropped out of the conversation until very recently. Um, so people kind of just stopped talking about Haiti, Liberia, and Ethiopia, but they were so important for Black Atlantic figures as prefigurations of Black sovereignty. I mean, they were nominally sovereign Black spaces, Black states, and yet all of them were either invaded or threatened with invasion or occupied in the interwar period. And one of the things that that also showed people is, well, we have a world that claims to be going in a progressive direction. Um, there's a sense in which things are getting better. You know, maybe it's not perfect, but there's a recognition that more and more freedom is going to be granted to the colonized. And yet, contradicting that, what we actually saw inside of black sovereignty was the reverse. I mean, where black people had enjoyed, you know, forms of recognized sovereignty in these three states, in each place and each context, it was rolled back. But it was rolled back in, in each case in a different way. And each of those ways, I suggest, involved a form of political mobilization of time. And I felt that Black Atlantic writers really tried to grapple with the ways in which time, when mobilized as a form of kind of politics, a political discourse, could be used to undermine um, freedom and, and perpetuate racialization and the ways in which racism and racialization could exist and endure even in context of juridical equality. So you can start to develop a world that looks more equal and yet where racialization endures through time and through the mobilization of time. And I think that that's very important for them thinking about, of course, the contemporary world, the post second world war world which in a sense is characterized by that contradiction, that paradox. On the one hand, we live in a world essentially of states that are supposed to be equal. And on the other hand, we have all of these forms of colonial racial division that have endured. How is that possible? Well, you know, the 20s and 30s helps us to think about that. Yeah, and I, I think that um, you talked in the introduction about how there has been a lot of attention to the spatialization of racial discourse and less to the, the temporal dimension of race of mm. racialization. And this last chapter where you talk about how um, ideas of time are kind of mobilized to undermine the sovereign project of these three countries, I think that's really an effective way of understanding how time in a sense eclipses place in, mm. in this mm. in this discourse. Yeah. Yeah. And to the way that time um, can, when it's conjoined to the global scale, then becomes so important for racialization. And, but then also, of course, for, for projects of anti-racism and anti-colonialism, they have to think about time and the world together, because of course, in a sense, you know, the whole idea of race is a kind of like a spatial temporal mapping of all of the world's people as you look at the all of the world's people in space and then you kind of map them onto this kind of temporal form of progression and black rice has recognized that without grappling with that um spatial temporal kind of fixation uh, they couldn't hope to escape the, the the limitations of race well Usam, thank you for uh, talking about your wonderfully written extremely clear uh, book, which I, as a historian, um, you know, I was a little bit nervous about engaging with something that was so theoretical, and I found it just really easy to read and really accessible. And so maybe this conversation has also given a sense of, of the clarity with which um, with which you speak about such complex matters. Thank you. And as we come as we come to a close, I wondered if you would talk to us about any future research projects that you're working on. Yeah. So. I have a couple of projects that have really emerged out of this one. And um, one of them is um, is a project where I'm trying to connect the history. Uh, it's really an intellectual history of global division and particularly of the North-South divide. 
And what I want to do in that project is it's called The Pillage of Distant Worlds, tentatively, which is based on a quote from the philosopher Herder. Um, but I wanted to connect histories of thinking about global division in different contexts, particularly connect the African and Latin American intellectual histories. So actually begin with what happens in the 20s and 30s and then move on to the 50s, 60s and 70s and try and address the reasons of like why that idea of North-South division of, of core periphery um, have been so important to anti-colonial thought and then go moving into the present to address some of the challenges that have emerged to that way of thinking, not not just from what you might think of as expected places, but also from the left and from forms of Marxist um, theorization. And I want to address very different conceptions about how about global inequality that have emerged to 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 really say, well, is there still a place for thinking about the world in this anti-colonial frame as a kind of north-south divide? Um, so that's that's one project. Um, and in another project, I'm looking at specific figures within the history of of um, Black Atlantic anti-colonialism and trying to think a bit more about what kind of contribution they made and kind of rethink their political thought. One of those people is Kwame Nkrumah. I mentioned at the start, I, I kind of began with him and then I worked backwards. And so now, you know, I returned to the archives in Accra and I really wanted to focus on Nkrumah as a theorist and think about what, well, how we might um, specify his particular form of kind of modernist, speed-oriented anti-colonialism and think about him in the context of West African intellectual history, which is, is very rarely done. And, and really kind of understand his, his contribution. Another person I'm very interested in with, with colleagues at this point is Jusay Mohamed Ali, uh, who was a very important figure at this time, um, working on him as well. Um, and then finally, um, there's a project where I am really trying to think about this feminist and anti-colonial connection that I mentioned earlier. And one of the ways I'm going to try and address that is also by thinking about ways in which feminism and anti-colonialism um, as theoretical perspectives and as ethics kind of address this question of domination and how they use scale to come to that conception of domination and ways in which that domination should be resisted and trying to think about some of the, the correspondences between the two ways of thinking. Oh, well, it seems like you have plenty to keep investing <laughs> <laughs> well, lots of projects, but that's exciting. And I think with a book as rich as this, which goes in so many different directions, it makes sense that, that you have all of these um, pathways that you want to follow up on. Yeah. Thank you so much.